Hello, my name is Nate. Welcome to my Fluid Art channel. Um, at the last minute, I decided to go ahead and do a voiceover for this video because when I was filming it, I had a bit of a sore throat and I sounded like a toad. <laughs> and um, I was clearing my throat a lot and everything was very distracting. So uh, it's one o'clock in the morning and you're going to hear some background noises, some Costa Rican nightlife happening here. Uh, but um, I think this will be much better than than what I had before. So um, I will walk you through my colors. I am working with DecoArt 24 karat gold and Amsterdam titanium white. Uh, that pink there is Amsterdam Persian rose and the red is TLP rad. So this little piggy rad. Most red colors that I found dry much darker than they appear wet. Um, and rad is the only red I've ever used that stays its true color. So I really like to use it when I want a, a bright, vibrant red. Uh, and then I'm also using Amsterdam Vermilion for the orange and then primary yellow from Amsterdam and also Amsterdam Turquoise Green. And then that last color there, the blue, is this little uh, this little piggy mermaid, which is one of, also one of my favorite colors. Um, I'm doing a diptych uh, in this painting or in this video. So uh, it's a pair of 30 by 30 canvases. And uh, my math tells me I need 32 ounces of paint. And um, I've layered two seven ounce cups. So that's only 14 ounces. And the reason I did that is because I wanted a lot of negative space also. So um, this is my base coat color. This is a custom blue. Um, it's this commission piece that I'm working on and the client wanted a navy blue. And custom blues can be really difficult because like reds, blues always dry darker than they first appear when they're wet. So it takes a little bit of practice and um, you kind of have to uh, develop a feel for it. You just have to keep in mind that it's going to dry darker. So my base coat color here is primary cyan and brilliant blue, both from Amsterdam. And then I've shaded that down to try and tone it down a bit with some greenish blue. And you'll see in the dry results that it does dry much darker and uh, the client loves it. So I think I nailed it. <laughs> Again, it just takes some practice, but uh, you'll develop a feel for, for getting the, the right tone when you're doing that. Um, and I like to tilt out my base coat before I pour my ribbons because I wanna make sure that when I pour my ribbons, they, um, have a smooth surface to um, land on so uh, the lines don't get wonky. A another trick for getting clean lines also is to commit to the motion when you're pouring out the cup. You want to start off of the canvas or off of the base coat and um, uh, go fairly quickly uh, so that you don't end up with really wobbly lines. Um, and so I've gotten down to the end of that first cup and now I'm gonna start on the second cup. I'm really doing this very intentionally trying to distribute the colors in all areas of the canvas. So I didn't have any blues on that side so I started in a different place. Oh, I love that, that pour right there. I love when the yellow, the orange, and that turquoise are in the same line together like that one. Oh, so pretty. Um, and I decided uh, at some point that I had enough of the warm colors that I didn't actually need to use this whole second cup. So I, yeah, I stop right there. And now I'm gonna put down my flow extender. My flow extender is uh, leftover paints, uh, lots of blues and greens. I know there's some white in there because it appears a little gray and, uh, and some table scrapings also. And the flow extender's purpose really is just to allow my poured colors to glide and, and flow over the canvas 
um, without sticking to it. I want the, the, the dry canvas needs something to stick to it, and I'd rather it be, you know, a, a leftover paint than, um, than the colors that I want to leave at the end. But sometimes when you're using leftover paints and table scrapings and that kind of thing, even though I strain them, you do still have to keep out, uh, keep an eye out for any lumps or, um, uh, you know, bumps and that kind of stuff. So you just kind of take that out. As soon as you see it, you take it out. So a lot of this video is going to be sped up because doing these two canvases, these two large canvases, uh, took me a, a little over an hour and a half to paint and I don't want to make you watch an hour and a half of this so I've left these first couple of tilts in real time so that you can see how slowly I'm moving the paint. My paint consistency is very thick it's a mound on a mound on a mound and uh, I use that consistency because I want my lines to maintain their shape but if I tilted too quickly, they would get really wonky very quickly. So I'm tilting out towards the corners and always remembering to take this, the weight of the paint back to the center before I change directions and go to another corner. And I'm not going over the edges. I really just want to spread this paint out a bit before I tilt to the corners or before I tilt off of the edges. Um, again, trying to keep the, the lines uh, and the color intensities the way they are. Tilting will give me lots of motion, but I don't want wonky lines and I don't want these colors to bleed out too much into each other. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll do these first couple of uh, tilts in real time. I'm still tilting very, very slowly. Um, these canvases uh, are so large they don't fit on my regular work table so I'm doing this on four kitchen trash cans plastic trash cans that I flipped over so that I have the the flat surface to work on and on each corner of my canvas I've put two giant push pins on opposite sides so there's actually eight push pins underneath this and that way, no matter which direction I'm tilting, I have a really stable uh, um, weight uh, for my tilting. Because there's a lot of paint on this canvas and it's quite heavy, so I really wanted to have that extra stability. So I used extra push pins in the corners. And now you can see that I've sped this up a bit. Um, and now that I've spread this uh, base coat colors and the ribbons out a bit, now I'm gonna start working towards this corner and go all the way off. And you can see I kind of walk the paint and so I take it exactly where I want it to be and then go back towards the corner and then work my way back in the opposite direction that I just went. So I'll go back to that other corner and I like to um, tilt towards that corner but then also catch the side when I go over at the same time. One of the beautiful things I think about this kind of pour is that the edges and the sides are just as interesting as the top. So you wanna take that paint all the way over and tilt off enough paint so that it covers the entire side. And sometimes I, tilt, I go back and forth a little bit to make sure I've really covered those sides. And working on large canvases like this, you really want to use more paint than you think. It's better to tilt off a lot of paint than to try and stretch these paints to cover the canvas and not be able to choose your composition. So now I've gone off all of the sides and I'm just going to tilt back and forth. I'm gonna make sure that all of my uh, edges are covered and all of my corners. And now I'm not really trying to lose any paint. I'm just putting those lines exactly where I want them. I want some chaos, but I want some structure. Oh, and it looks like I missed that one corner there. So I'm gonna go back to that corner and take it off and make a couple more adjustments. And this one will be done. Uh, yeah, so 
Now I'm gonna put on some music for you. Save my voice so I don't get a scratchy voice again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'll put on some music for you so you can watch me do the second one, which is very sped up because it's exactly the same as the first one. Um, I quite like this and I know my client does too, so I'm very happy. So um, do those YouTube -y things and like and subscribe and um, uh, leave a comment before you go and go mix up some paints and be fearless. on the floor.